Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. This afternoon's webinar is really a kind of um, an overview um, of the uh, supervision guide, kind of how we got here, why we did it, that kind of thing, but also a bit of an overview of what's inside and the kind of things we think it might be used for. <clears throat> and um, we should have plenty of time at the end for uh, a bit of a discussion around um, issues around doctoral scholarship that uh, people might, you know, want to elaborate or also, you know, ideas for future projects that might kind of come off the back of this or um, complement it in some way. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rob Farrow. I'm one of the co-directors of GoGN and based at the Open University in the UK. Um, just a little bit about the uh, background to GoGN for anyone who's watching this and is not a member of GoGN. Uh, GoGN is the Global OER Graduate Network, and we exist to raise the profile and support uh, researchers in open education, um, especially in the Global South. Um, we have various ways of supporting uh, people doing doctoral research. And in addition to supporting openness and OER and OEP projects, we also explore openness uh, within the context of research as part of uh, the network activity. If you'd like uh, some more information on the background of GoGN, um, I suggest you have a look here at our strategic review, which looks back at the last 10 years of activity and indicates some of the possible future directions for the network. Um, so as I say, one of the um, things that we've been doing um, since 2020 is producing resources for researchers aimed at people who are doing doctorates. Um, but as we know, um, the reach of these publications is many times greater than the size of the network. So to put that um, in context a little bit, um, we've got approaching 400 members of GoGN, but the Research Methods Handbook, which was the first um, book that we published in this series, that's been downloaded almost 20,000 times, I think. Um, and we don't know how many times it's been shared outside of that. That's just coming off our own website. So we know that there's a market, if you like, for these kind of uh, publications. Um, and it's kind of interesting the way that we can maybe use openness as a way to kind of fulfill those um, requirements and to uh, empower people who are interested in doing research. Um, so within the series so far, we've had the uh, Research Methods Handbook, which you just mentioned, Conceptual Framework Guide, um, the EDI guidelines, the research reviews, and so on. And we consolidated those into our uh, Open Research Handbook last year. So there's one place where you can access most of the stuff that we've published so far. Um, but that was never intended to be the end of the uh, sequence. And um, we've, we've still got several guides that are kind of, you know, penciled in as things that we could uh, write in the future. Um, but this is one that was requested by members. And um, you can see why, right? Because it's relevant to anyone who's uh, in the position of either doing a doctorate as the student or supervising a doctorate as the supervisor or as a member of a supervisory committee and, and that kind of, kind of thing. Um, and so we always knew we were going to um, work on this guide. And one of the things that we also liked about it was there was also a chance to have some collaboration between the student members and the uh, alumni supervisors and experts, um, whereas a lot of the time we tend to treat these these two groups a little bit differently, which you know I think is understandable depending on you know what you're doing. Um, but this gave us a chance to encourage the kind of collaboration, the sharing of perspective. And one of the things that we like to do with these uh, guides and handbooks is try to take an open approach to it and try to encourage people to share things about the process that they might not otherwise share, if you like, or you know they, they might share in a slightly sanitized way. Um, and so that's a, a feature of all the books uh, in these in this series. Um, I think it's also worth saying that in this case, um, one of the interesting things um, when we first put the feelers out to members and sort of asked to have some input into this, there were several people who just told us, look, I'm not really comfortable talking about this. <laughs> and it might even have been quite a long time um, since they had these experiences as part of their own um, uh, doctoral uh, journey. 
Um, but these things can leave quite quite deep marks. And I think everyone's had things about the process of supervision which they had strong feelings about. Um, and I think it shows in some ways that there's, there's kind of a taboo still around discussing some of this stuff. Um, or at least mostly it's something that happens behind closed doors when there is an issue and it gets dealt with in a very kind of um, controlled way. Um, so we weren't trying to like, you know, blow up the hornet's nest or anything with, like that. But I just think it's just an interesting bit of context around this is like trying to find the right level of sharing, you know, and trying to find um, a place where people feel comfortable talking about this stuff. So in terms of the process, um, earlier in the summer, maybe it was late spring, you might remember, we sent out a survey. So we often start these guys by sending out a survey. Um, we had 21 people who responded. And um, of those, I think 11 of them were supervisors as well as um, PhD student, uh, doctoral students. And so we asked them in, in sort of two sections. One was aimed at people who had um, experience of supervision as the student. And um, that applies to everybody. But then there's also a section for those people who also supervise. And so we, we collected some, some information from them as well. Um, over the summer, this was used to build a kind of um, small kind of base of themes and key questions and that kind of thing. And then um, did a bit of desk research over the summer, started drafting stuff, started trying to pull it all together. Um, also, uh, as part of the writing process, um, I spent some time with Brian Mathers, who's the artist we work with. Um, and that's also a way for us to kind of continue to draw out key themes, but also kind of uh, themes we can use in the artwork um, and things that might be a bit sort of subterranean um, or not quite kind of evidently expressed. And um, I think that took place in September. Um, so. I had more or less a full draft by the time we got to the end of September. Um, I did go to a workshop in Sweden um, to try to develop this guide a bit um, at the end of September. And I'll say a bit about that in a second. Um, and then this month we've had a, an open editorial peer review. Um, and I'm grateful for the, to the co-authors for coming in and, and contributing to that. Um, we also did something that we don't normally do which is we asked some people to validate what we were doing. And um, normally we rely purely on the kind of uh, open editorial process among the co-authors. Um, but I did feel like in this case, because there are some people who are not in the network who are experts in doctoral supervision, um, I thought it was worth trying to bring some people in for that. And I think it was useful actually, and maybe it's something that we'll do in future publications as well. So um, that's the process, that, that's how we got there. Um, just a, a note on this uh, conference that I attended um, last month. Um, so I'm not aware of any other conferences that are purely focused on doctoral supervision. Maybe you're aware of some. It's the first time that I've been to one. And um, it was actually a pretty useful experience for me um, just to kind of get a sense of kind of what are the contemporary issues around supervision scholarship. Um, I also kind of discovered that there is a field of, of supervision scholarship, which is not a surprise exactly, but I never really had engaged with it like that much before. Um, and I also think that maybe there's maybe some scope for GoGN doing some more research in that area specifically. It may or may not be connected to openness, um, but this is a growing area um, um, from what I can tell. And although the stuff that I experienced there, a lot of it was kind of very Scandinavian focused, as you might expect, um, it's also quite quite relevant to everybody, right? With stuff around good practice and that kind of thing. If you want to go to the website, which I've, I've put the link in at the bottom of the page there, um, you can access all of the abstracts from the presentations. And you might find it useful or just interesting to kind of flick through there and just have a look and see, you know, the kind of stuff that people were talking about. Um, Certainly the keynotes, even if you did nothing else, have a look at the keynotes. Um, I also wanted to share um, this resource quickly because this was the most comprehensive bibliography that I found for everything to do with doctoral supervision. And um, you can see here there's 20 categories. Each of those is a bibliography. And so there was way too much to go through for this project. Um, but we do link to it in the in the guide. And we also link to a whole range of different kind of um, 
resources, frameworks, further reading, interesting websites and, and stuff like that. Partly because one thing that we realized quite quickly, and this is the longest guide that we've written so far, but we realized quite quickly we, we just can't cover everything, right? There's so much stuff that you could write about. Um, and so what we've tried to do is kind of give a critical pathway through a lot of this stuff, um, but also say, look, if you want to know more, this is where to look. So that's worth a look if you're a supervisor or interested in supervision. Um, when I was in the um, conference in Sweden, um, I put this question to the people in the workshop and just said, you know, one way of thinking about this stuff is if you could go back in time to meet yourself on day one of your doctorate, what kind of advice would you give yourself? And in some ways, this is another way of asking the question, what have you learned about all this stuff, you know, through the process of doing it? What have you learned about you know, how to do this stuff successfully and, and practically? Um, so I just invite you to sort of reflect on that as we move through the, the rest of the slides and uh, maybe we can pick up on that in the um, discussion at the end. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk through now some of the different sections of the handbook, uh, the guide very briefly. Um, and we start with a bit of a history of um, doctoral education and kind of where it comes from and where the traditions come from. Um, for this, I wanted a, a picture of some doctoral robes for this um, um, slide. And, um, you know, so I just Googled doctoral robes. Funnily enough, the thing that came up, uh, this is my uh, alma mater, right? So this is where I did my PhD at the University of Essex. And so these are the robes that I wore um, when I graduated. And, um, you know, it's the floppy hat and the gown and, and all the rest of it. Um, and as you're probably aware, these things have their roots in the medieval tradition. Um, and the medieval tradition is, is, you know, it still has quite a lot of influence on the way that the actual doctoral process works. Um, although at the time, there were no formal education processes or um, programs for doctoral education when these things first started. And you would literally just, you know, basically go straight into a viva, right? I guess you'd be a kind of traveling scholar or something. Um, and then people would just, you know, put you through your paces. And if they think, yeah, okay, you're, you're a learned, um, I guess, man at the time, you get to wear the hat, you know, <laughs> and that kind of thing. Um, but it's interesting um, to, to sort of think about the historical progression of this stuff, partly because um, certain principles are sort of still there. They're really part of the, the foundation of all this stuff where, you know, you might have a mentor, you know, you, but you, your overall goal is, is the cultivation of independence. Um, and also the, the kind of um, the way in which um, the, the process has got gradually formalized over time, but then you still have these remnants of the, you know, things like the viva, the floppy hat, the sword, if you're lucky enough, um, and that kind of thing. But I think it's important to try and give a bit of a sense of kind of the historical grounding for some of these things, because as we say in more detail in the guide, there's a lot of ways in which it still influences the process now. Um, so then we have a section which is talking about um, what kind of interactions you might expect from a research supervisor. Um, and this is partly about managing expectations, but it's also about trying to get people to conceptualize the, the process in the right way. Um, because it's quite easy to go into, into a doctoral program and not really know what to expect, right? Um, and we go into some more detail around that, but we get try to get people to start thinking, what kind of interactions are you expecting? What do you think a supervisor is there to do? Um, we also talk a bit about the need to find the right combination of supervisor and student. And um, we've got this sort of tongue in cheek illustration here about, you know, different archetypes of academics, if you like, and the kind of things that, you know, some people might be drawn to different, you know, styles. You might think, ah, oh, this person's a famous professor with loads of publications. They'd be a good supervisor. I'm not saying that they wouldn't be, but that's not the only thing to consider. There's other things to consider, like how much time do they have to devote to your projects? Um, do you have the right kind of personal chemistry and a match of working styles and these kind of things? Um, but also to sort of say it from the supervisor's point of view, bearing in mind that you don't always get a choice about taking students on, right? Some people are just expected to, or they get assigned a student and that kind of thing. Um, but there's also a sense in which it's a, it's a, a something for the, the supervisor to think about. Am I matching with the right students? Um, and, and and again, just to get people to sort of sort of conceptualize it 
in that way. Uh, and we developed this idea of different archetypes um, uh, a bit later on. Um, one thing that comes across very, very clearly if you look at the literature around um, doctoral supervision is that the key things for success seem to be around clear expectations and clear communication around what is happening in this process. And um, there are other things, obviously, like, you know, submitting work on time and being receptive to feedback and all that sort of stuff. But if you don't have this kind of core thing around setting, setting expectations, everything else becomes more difficult. Um, and there are some resources that we point to um, and tools that are designed purely to establish from the very, very start what's supposed to be happening, what are the expectations. Um, and obviously, a lot of the time, this stuff is in the rules and regulations of the university and that kind of thing. Um, but that in itself, it's still important to have the, the conversation between supervisor team and student around what are, these, what are the expectations here and how is it going to work going forward. So we give some tips around that and there's some links to tools that um, uh, people can use. Um, we also then have a section which looks at the differences between um, the uh, PhD or the professional doctorate, usually the EdD in this case, and how that might influence the process. Um, and here, I guess, part of what the thinking is, is around uh, someone who's doing a practice-based professional doctorate may have a slightly different set of requirements. They may, may need some different kinds of support. Uh, and there may be a different framing for what's going on. Um, and so that's something that, um, you know, it does apply to a lot of our members. You know, we have a lot of PhD students, but also a lot of EdD students. Um, and so this is something else we encourage people to think about. Um, what kind of difference does it make if you're on the professional doctorate track? Um, as a kind of development from this archetypes idea, which, to be honest, um, you know, it's partly a brainstorm thing with a, with a kind of cool illustration. It's not exactly grounded in like research data. You know, we're not appealing to some idea of like people identifying as, you know, um, a maverick or something. But we did develop um, some sort of archetypal ways of thinking about what it is that a supervisor is doing and what kind of roles they have to put to take part in or what kind of hats they might have to wear as part of their role. Um, and it's also about different personalities and, you know, people have got different strengths and that kind of thing. And so I think this does relate to the idea of, you know, matching with a supervisor. Um, but this it's not presented as a sort of scientific idea, or, you know, at, the, at this stage. I think you could maybe do some work around this. It would be quite interesting. I think it's also worth saying that you might need a different style at different points in the process of the doctorate. So you might need more guidance at the start. Um, maybe you need more inspiration at the start. But then at the end, it's more about kind of getting over the line and, you know, ticking the boxes and making sure you've got everything done. Um, and so the six styles of interaction that we speak about um, in this section are um, the model. So someone who's modeling what it is that an academic does, what a researcher does. Um, uh, and you can kind of see that close up and maybe emulate it and um, maybe develop from it. Um, being a mentor, which obviously is... is, is some similarities to the first, but it's got that more of a sort of coaching dimension, personal support, uh, co-planning, that kind of thing. Um, the muse archetype would be uh, the more one more around inspiration, creativity, finding new perspectives, finding something original. Um, the manager is more of a, um, you know, focused on the day to day, making sure things are getting done when they need to get done. Um, interactions with the university bureaucracy and uh, other things like that, um, being on time with getting things in for calls for papers and that sort of thing. Um, the mediator, uh, basically mediator may not be the best word for this because in a way, I, I don't know how we ended up with this kind of M theme that they all started with M. Um, but the mediator is really the one that's more focused on sort of emotional support, uh, navigating the sort of psychological challenges around a doctorate, maybe things to do with, you know, the complexities of life um, for the PhD student or the EdD student and that kind of thing. Um, and then the motivator is there to kind of, you know, give the push, keep people going, keep them motivated. And in reality, there's a mix of all these things going on at once, I would say. Um, but they're mainly presented as ideas to think about rather than, you know, 
scientifically proven types. Um, so as I say, we, we have a lot of stuff around setting expectations. And um, I think, you know, if you think about your own experience, and we, we know from the survey that we did and, you know, the responses that are in the guide, um, people have diverse experiences and also diverse expectations when you're going into a, a program. Um, and so in some ways, this is the main thing, the main advice that you can kind of give to someone who's starting a doctor, I think, is you've got to get the expectations really, really clear um, for everyone's benefit. Everything goes better that way. Um, we also do a bit of a dip into what does it look like to be, you know, doing the right thing? What does good practice look like in these scenarios? And he started getting into, you know, some complexity because obviously there's different disciplines, there's different styles, different ways of working and that kind of thing. And you can't be too prescriptive about it. But we do find, you know, a few things in the literature that kind of illustrate what that, what it might look like when it's going well and what it might look like when it's not going well. Um, we do do a few uh, nice bits of artwork in the guide, um, but there were definitely fewer things that we could visualize in the literature around doctoral research, as you might expect. It's not a particularly visual subject a lot of the time. Um, we did convert this. Uh, so there's two images here. Like the first one that you're looking at now is based on a supervisor's map of what's happening in a PhD. And um, the key thing here is that there's like lots of different things going on but they're kind of understood to be in a sort of balance or a kind of uh, an architectonic you know a series of link structures that kind of form a whole and so things like uh the different aspects of the of the of the doctorate and how well they're going uh how how well the um how much progress is being made are we working towards some publications is there a career pathway emerging um, and all these different kind of um, elements that are um, typically considered at the same time. Um, and when you looked at the students map, it's a bit more linear, a bit more chaotic. Um, there's this sort of one thing that's the main focus, which is I've got to write this thesis. But then there's all these kind of other things that kind of distract, but it's not as clearly um, delineated as it is for the supervisor, which is probably what you'd expect, right? Um, these graphics are quite loosely based on this paper, but I thought it was quite an interesting um, thing to think about, you know, to, to ask people maybe to, you know, to sketch this kind of thing. What does it look like? What are all the things? How do they connect to each other? Um, but the point is that the, the students is much more linear, um, whereas the supervisors tend to be more, um, more structural. Um, we have a section around supporting academic writing. Uh, but part of what we say there is, you know, one of the key things to understand about a doctorate is that it's, you know, mostly, at least typically, a writing based pedagogy. You write stuff, you get feedback. And so it's a really important part of the whole thing. Um, I think some supervisors offer that support in developing writing and others kind of see it as something that the students are just supposed to get better at and work at and, and so on. Um, but it's really a key thing. and I think it's worth having explicit discussions um, around the expectations. Um, we also sort of delve into some of the areas where you might say, you know, what happens when you're having negative experiences, right, when it's not going the way that it's supposed to. Um, we highlight that there's a danger of comparison um, in the sense that um, everyone's, you know, it's easy to kind of project uh, to people that it's all going well, whereas only you really know how well it's going. And the same applies to other people. Um, and so sometimes it can it can seem to the student like everyone else's PhD is going well, right? And mine is not. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with my supervisor. Something's wrong. Um, and there's a bit of a danger in all this. Um, where actually comparing with other people is not really that helpful, because really the the examination that you're undertaking over the years that you're doing a doctorate is just about you meeting the standard that you need to meet by the university has set. And so there's a danger here, but there can also be some value in in comparing what's going on with other people. But there's there's it's more a note of caution around this, I think. Um, of course, what we're doing in this guide is partly comparing experiences. So you've got to sort of see it in that um, aspect as well. Um, on this note, um, I thought this was an interesting uh, graphic and we redrew it. Um, basically, it's sort of showing 
uh, at a sort of acceptable zone of progress in the middle here in the, in the white bit um, where you're trying to get to the finish line of the PhD, which is up in the top right corner. Um, and you can have a kind of overly functional student, if you like, um, who is very independent, very clever, um, but maybe doesn't quite understand what's happening in the doctorate and what they need to do in the doctorate to pass the doctorate. Um, and so they could be brilliant, right, and very capable of doing a doctorate, but maybe they're not just not progressing or not conceptualizing it in the right way. Um, and of course, you can be someone who's um, low functional, according to this terminology, um, maybe not motivated, maybe likely to drop out. Um, and in some ways, you know, maybe there's something here to try and help people understand where are you in all this? Where do you feel like you are in all this? Or maybe it's something that you could um, discuss with a supervisor and try and get a, a sense check on where the project is at the moment. Um, one theme that kind of came across quite strongly in the um, survey data that we got was around the importance of um, acknowledging and managing the sort of power dynamics that exist in the supervisory relationship. And they're kind of inevitable, right? Because um, you wouldn't be there if you didn't think that the supervisor had progressed to a level that you were aspiring to progress to as a researcher or as an academic or as a teacher or whatever. So there's always going to be these power dynamics and supervisors also have power through their institutional roles and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so, again, partly here it's about communication, um, but it's also about understanding what's a reasonable ex expectation of this situation and how do you identify behavior that is not reasonable anymore and is you know, inappropriate. And so we do kind of, you know, we don't go too far into that, don't, don't sort of portray it too negatively or the idea that there's some inevitable, you know, there's going to be some kind of um, impropriety, because I don't think it is like that. But everyone's heard stories, right, about things that have gone wrong in these relationships where there's been inappropriate behavior and that kind of thing. So we definitely acknowledge that and we kind of point to some resources where people might want to, you know, look further if that's something that they're concerned about. Um, we also have a section where we talk about how to approach challenges. It's a challenging experience for most people, certainly as a student, often as a supervisor. And um, again, a lot of it comes down to how are you communicating? How are you working as a team with your, uh, between the student and the supervisors to actually approach these things together and make progress through them together? Um, and certainly sometimes the worst thing you can do is kind of hide away and pretend it's not happening, right? Um, so there's a section there um, we've got a graphic here um, which tries to um, show at least one way of approaching um, uh, communication issues or problem solving. Um, and it takes into account that students might not be aware of the thing that you're trying to get them to see, right? And they might not understand it very easily, very clearly, because you know they just haven't been through this process before. So um, this idea of a continuous feedback process, I think, is, is, is quite a useful one because most of the problems that you might encounter within a doctorate are solvable, right, with the right approach and the right mindset and the right um, habits. And so it's getting people to see that. Um, we also acknowledge that there are some occasions where it's just not going to work out and there can be various reasons for that. And it can be that the right thing to do is to cease that supervisory relationship. Um, it could be that you change supervisors and we sort of give a bit of advice around around that and sort of say that, you know, you've got to be quite sure in a way that um, it's the supervisor that's the problem, because if it's not, then you can change supervisors and you're still going to have the same issues, right? So, um, so we offer some advice around that as well. Um, obviously, it's not the kind of thing that um, anyone wants to see happen. Um, but it can be for the best, um, depending on what's going on in that scenario. And, you know, also people's projects evolve over time, uh, personalities evolve over time, and, you know, it can be the right thing to call it a day. Um, that's just reality, I guess. Uh, we also talk about kind of um, the idea of doctoral education as a process of um, increased and cultivated independence. So the idea is at the start, you're kind of quite dependent on your supervisor, um, but by the end, you should be the independent researcher. And in a way, this is one of the things that you're being examined on in a doctorate. Can you be independent? Um, and so we have a section around that and kind of what, what the 
best practices around that might look like um, or how to keep it in mind as a, an important kind of motif, at least. Um, we also have a section around career progression. I think experiences vary around this because some people's supervisors are very proactive um, in trying to help people in their careers, um, maybe sharing information with them about possible job opportunities and that kind of thing, writing references and so on. Um, and that's definitely the best, you know, scenario. I think no one's actually sort of technically obliged to do that, right? Um, it's not necessarily something you can expect a supervisor to do. Um, it's definitely good if they are prepared to do that. But for a lot of people, their supervisor might not be that supportive. And in a way, that's not part of their role. Strictly speaking, their, their role was to get you through your doctorate. Um, and so after that, you might not find that um, there's a lot of contact. I think both of those things, both those outcomes are quite natural. You know, some some of these relationships persist. Some people go on to collaborate with their supervisors quite regularly. They may even become colleagues and that kind of thing. Um, but if that doesn't happen, it doesn't mean that someone's done something wrong or that supervisors failed to support you in, in that way. It's just that that's beyond the scope of the doctorate itself. Um, but we, we, I think you could also say that, that maybe that's where you get into the role of something like a network uh, such as GoGN, um, which can kind of give you that support, um, even if a supervisor isn't. Um, so I'm not going to talk much longer. Um, just some reflections on the process itself. Um, as I said at the start, some people, this is this is not a very comfortable thing to discuss. We had anonymous contributions, you know, so people didn't want to be identified. Um, I think offering a bit of a general advice around the supervision process is um, sometimes a bit challenging because there's so many different contexts. And it's funny because there's, you know, they, they all have these kind of structural similarities, but the cultures and um, the disciplinary uh, traditions and stuff can be a bit different. So one challenge there was, you know, how can we talk in just the most general terms about this stuff? Um, there was also a bit of um, back and forth around you know, who is this for? You know, it, are we writing mainly for students or is it students and supervisors equally? Um, I think in the end, we tried to kind of frame it as if this is for, for, for both people. But most of our resources, the idea generally is that it's something that you would give to a, a student on day one of their doctorate to help them. So that's the kind of underlying kind of concept that we often work with. Um, but in a way, this is about facilitating a dialogue between students and supervisors as much as anything. And I think one potential use case for this book is to um, to share with the supervisor and to use that as the basis of a discussion going forward around, you know, how's it going to work in the future? Um, we did also have this kind of underlying theme that we were inter interested in, which was, are there specific things about open education research that have implications for how a doctorate works and how supervision works. And um, I'm, I'm not sure that we got to a final kind of view on that. Um, there's some, a lot of quotes right at the very end. Um, I think there's maybe some work to be done around this actually, um, because lots of people said, yes, you know, openness is really a strong part of what I do. And it's a strong part of the way that my doctorate works. Um, but I also had um, people saying, look, it doesn't make a difference what you're, what you're studying. The rules are the rules. Good practice is good practice. And yeah, OK, you might be interested in open education, but so what? Right. It's just the same thing regardless. And I can sort of see both those ideas. Um, I think the truth is probably some com some complex combination of those things for a lot of people. Um, but I do think it's an area where we could potentially do some research in the future around this or elaborate this um, to the sort of general article level. Um, and so that's something that we might, might bring forward. Uh, so, just want to say thank you uh, to the co-authors. Um, there's a few of you in the uh, webinar now. Um, it's really essential in these, you know, making these guides that we have the input from the members. So, very grateful for the time that you've spent to progress this project with me. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the validation team. Um, everyone's credited in the guide as well. Uh, obviously, thanks to Brian for the artwork, as ever. Um, 
The guide itself is now online. You can access it on the GoGM website under the um, outputs. And um, in the coming days, I'm going to put a blog post up with the recording of this webinar and a link to the um, uh, guide as well. So um, we've got a bit of time for discussions um, and we've really got a kind of, you know, an open floor in a way. Like my prompt is really about uh, people, the idea of people going back and you know trying to advise themselves. Um, you could maybe say, if you were to go back and advise yourself, would you listen to yourself? Like, or could you understand yourself? I think it's a fair question. Maybe that's getting too philosophical about it. Um, but that's one way that you could think about um, the, uh, the, the as, as a discussion prompt. Um, I'll finish with the slides. Um, we've got a, 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 a QR code here for anyone who wants to join the network. And uh, I'll just say thank you for listening and I'll come out of the slides so I can see people and have a chat. Thanks.